The Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Romans 13 verse 11 Is that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep? For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. For Thessalonians 5 verse 6 Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The sermon was preached in the Abbey Church at Westminster upon the 27th of January, 1647, the day appointed for their solemn and public humiliation. This prophet Isaiah is famous both for promises and threatenings, for promising comfort, for threatening judgments. When he promises mercies, he ordinarily intermixes spiritual with temporal mercies. When he denounces judgments, he often threatens spiritual as well as temporal. For the latter, namely, judgments denounced. In this chapter, he threatens temporal judgments to the verse 7 and spiritual judgments to the verse 15 of Isaiah 29. For temporal judgments, he tells us against whom he denounces them, against Jerusalem called the city where David dwelt. Ariel signifies the Lion of God, Jerusalem being so called either because of its potency and strength. As the Lion is a prince of beasts, so was Jerusalem of cities. And Judah, in which tribe Jerusalem was, is, Genesis 49 verse 9, called a Lion, and a Lion's whelp. And it set out the greatness of this power. It is also called here a Lion of God an usual expression to denote the excellency and greatness of a thing. Jerusalem is by some thought to be called the Lion of God in regard of the temple and altar therein, which has the same name, Ezekiel 43, verses 15 and 16, because they looked upon their temple and altar as their strength, and trusted more in that than in all their other supplies, thinking that so long as they had them, they had God among them or in regard of the abundance of sacrifices which their altar devoured, even as a lion devours beasts. Jerusalem is thought by others to be termed here by the prophet, the Lion of God, in regard of its fierceness and cruelty against the servants and messengers of God, as a lion devours the lamb according to that of Jeremiah 12, verses 7 and 8. I have forsaken my house, and so on. My heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest that cries against me. Jerusalem is called the city where David dwelt, in which God would blast and slight the vain opinion of their worth and goodness and privileges, because David once lived there. In this denouncing of temporal judgments, he opposes their security, in which they promise to themselves in regard of the delay of vengeance and their daily sacrifices, safety and peace. He foretells a judgment that should befall them. I will distress Ariel. I will camp against you, round about, and lay siege against you, verses 2 and 3. And this a prophet further amplifies, for on the lowness of their condition, that extreme contemptibleness that hereafter they should lie under, they shall be brought down, and speak out of the ground and out of the dust, as one that has a familiar spirit. Though now their voice is proud and thundering, though now they lift up themselves against my threatening prophets, yet when my judgment shall befall them, they shall rather whisper than speak. Thou shalt be so fearful and poor, even as a familiar spirit send forth a trembling, sad, soft, whispering voice out of the earth to those that inquire of them. Verse 4. The prophet amplifies this judgment that should befall them, from the inefficacy of all those helps and helpers that should come to them for their assistance, all the multitude of strangers that should come to help them, against God should be as a chaff and dust. God would as easily puff them away and ruin them with the storm and tempest and thunder, verse 5 and 6. The spiritual judgment that should lie upon them all this while, their calamity was in its nearest approaches, was an insensible, regardless, secure temper of soul, taking no heed, giving no regard to all these dismal denunciations. 
which wretched distemper under their approachable calamities is set out under a threefold resemblance. First, of a sweet and delightful dream in which deluded persons please themselves with thoughts of food and fullness, though they are hungry and empty. Verse 8. Number two, of a drunken staggering person that doesn't regard what the dangers are that hang over his head. A spiritual drunkenness, worse than with wine, had invaded their hearts and heads in which reason was so clogged and dulled that nothing was perceived that was preached. Verse 9. Number 3. Of a deep and dead sleep, even the spirit of it, in which their senses were, as it were, so stupefied and benumbed, that did the prophets cry and call in their ears never so loud they would lie still yet, and not stir up themselves to shun or prevent the dismal judgments that were seizing on them. The Lord has poured upon you the spirit of a deep sleep. In the prosecution of which words all that I shall do shall be reduced to these two heads. First, to explain the text and the particular parts of it. Secondly, to gather and handle one particular observation from the several parts of it and explain it. For the first, I shall open this text in these four following parts and branches. Number one, the kind and nature of the judgment that had here befallen them, a deep sleep. Number two, the measure and degree of it, which is set forth by a double expression, the word spirit. The word pouring. Number three, the object or who they were upon whom this deep sleep was poured. The Jews. Number four, the punisher or the party inflicting this judgment. The Lord. First, the kind of sort of punishment it was a deep sleep. In the Hebrew, tardama. A word that signifies such a sleep as does so stupefy and benumb the senses, as that the person on whom it seizes can very hardly by any means use be awakened. And this may appear both by the consideration how the scripture uses it in other places, and also how it is rendered by the interpreter. Adam is said to be in a deep sleep, Genesis 2 verse 21 and so deep a sleep that a rib was taken out of him, and yet he did not perceive it. Saul was in a deep sleep from the Lord, and notwithstanding his spear, and his cruise was taken from his bolster, nay, notwithstanding his mortal enemy, as he supposed him, was very near him, yet he awoke not. Judges 4 verse 21, that Jael, notwithstanding her approaches, her nail, her hammer, and smiting did not awake him. Jonah was so deep and asleep in Jonah 1 verse 6, that jeopardy of life by reason of the tempestuous raging of the sea did not at all affect him. Nay, in Psalm 76 verse 6, the destruction and the total overthrow of the chariots and horsemen are set forth by this expression of deep sleep. Now in all these places, either the word tartama here in the text or a word purely of the same signification, and coming from the same root, is used, which root is radam, signifying to be overwhelmed with sleep. The Septuagint rendered this word several ways, sometimes a word that signifies such an astonishment by reason of fear, is that a man is not himself, or knows not what he does. Sometimes they render it, by a word which signifies a man's going out of himself. Sometimes they render it by a word that the apostle makes use of in Romans 11 verse 8, where my text is alleged, a word which does notably set out the nature of this deep sleep according to whatever interpretation we consider it. A derivative of it signifies to prick or to wound. And so either this word imports such a sleep out of which all the pinching and wounding and pricking cannot raise a man, or such a sleep in which a man is so fastened and nailed down to a sloth that there is no parting them, or such a sleep as in which a person is one that is so pained with his wounds that he regards nothing which is said to him, which way soever we understand, though I prefer that interpretation which imports such a sleep as, in which a man is so deeply seized upon with it, 
is that no wounding or pricking awakens him. Which way soever I say we understand it, we need to conceive it to be an extreme deep sleep, not bodily, but spiritual, not a binding of the animal spirits and senses, but a spiritual torpor and benumbedness of soul under all the dispensations and dealings of God, in which a soul is in such a temper, state, and posture, as a body in a dead and deep sleep liable to all enemies, unactive though there be never such cry unto it for help, self-soothing in the midst of all dangers, insensible of any stirrings, and unwilling to be awakened. Number two, the degree or measure of this punishment is set down in a text in a double expression. First, the spirit of sleep. Number two, the spirit of sleep poured out. For the word spirit, it very aptly and fully sets out the vehemency and depth of this sleep, because these eager inclinations are furthered by the spirit, either good, if they be good inclinations, or a bad spirit, if they be bad inclinations. Because these inclinations are seated in the spirit of a man, carrying the whole man according to its own bent. Because the spirit of a thing does frequently betoken force, energy, power, efficacy. The spirit of anything being the strength of it, and vigor of it. So the scripture expounds the spirit of Elijah by the power of Elijah. And so the spirit of sleep is the efficacy and force and strength of sleep that is seized on them. To the making of this spiritual judgment more full, it is said that this deep sleep was poured out in the Hebrew, nathach, a word that has two significations according to the different nature of those things, moist or dry, about which it is spoken, both very apt to set forth the degree of this sleep. First, being used concerning the pouring out of liquid and moist things, it signifies he has so poured it out upon you that it is run all over you, it being mostly applied by the scripture to the pouring out of the drink offering upon the sacrifice, which drenched it and ran over it. So of the oil that was poured out on Jacob's pillar. Here, therefore, when it is said in this sense that a deep sleep is poured out on them, the meaning is they are soaked in it steeped in it, drenched, drowned in it. Being used concerning dry things, it signifies to hide all over, to cover, even over the head and the ears, no part of the thing covered being to be seen. And so it is applied to the covering of sin that makes a man blessed. Psalm 32, verse 1. None of his sins being to be seen. Here it being used, it imports such a covering with a deep sleep, is that no part is free, every part having the spiritual benumbedness season upon it. They were all over, all parts and degrees of men in the kingdom under the power of this deep sleep, their head, ears, eyes, arms, legs, their rulers, their prophets, their priests, and people, as afterwards God speaks particularly and distributively. Number three, the object or the persons on whom this punishment was poured, is expressed here in the word you, a word in which is intimated both the generality of the judgment. Upon the body and bulk of the kingdom is this judgment inflicted, and their pertinency and settledness under it, that it was poured out upon them, that were so often reproved and stirred and called upon by the prophets to awake, nay, a people that had judgment even at their doors and ready to fall upon them, it being near in point of execution and far off in point of their apprehension. Number four, the punisher or the party inflicting this, Jehovah the Lord. He does it in wrath and fury, God being here to be considered not as the author, as the avenger, not the worker, not as the effector, but the inflictor, not as the cause of it, but the punisher with it, God not infecting any with the spiritual benumbedness, or infusing it into any where it was not before, but punishing those further with it who had it of themselves. For the further explication of this, note three, 
things about that spiritual distemper of a deep sleep. It means a natural desire to be at rest, a readiness to wish and tend to our own peace and preservation, and this inclinableness to self-preservation is of God. Number two, the distemperature of the soul in soothing itself with thoughts and apprehensions of peace while living in a course of sin, against the threatenings and commands of God, a blessing oneself in his heart saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart. This is not of God, but from our own corruption. Number three, a just reward and recompense by way of punishing and avenging the corrupt and obstinate inclination of the soul in sin, notwithstanding all the means of grace, with more benevolence and spiritual sloth. And this God does, I say, only as a judge and an avenger, and that in a number of ways. First, by removing and denying the outward means of grace for contempt of them, which means were ordained for the awakening of people out of the sleep of sin as sermons, corrections, and admonitions. Number two, denying the inward operation of a spirit where he gives the outward means of grace, restraining his efficacious, exciting grace. And so God is denying that grace which he is not bound to give, which grace would have hindered them from this distemper. Number three, by a judicial tradition of these self-soothers up to that power and spirit, which shall more clothe and clasp up their souls in the spiritual distemper. And so God delivers people up to Satan and to their own hearts when he sees that people more obey them than him, paying more attention to their allurements than to God's incitements. When God saith judicially, let him that is filthy be filthy still, I deliver him up into the power both of Satan and his own heart. Thus, 1 Kings 22, verses 22 and 23, The Lord sent a lying spirit to persuade Ahab. So Psalm 81, 11 and 12, I gave them up unto their own hearts, and they walked in their own counsels. Number four, by offering and laying such occasions before men as God knows they will abuse to the soothing up themselves against all his awakening and administrations is impunity, long life, friends, honor, and so on, which not sanctified, the corrupted stomach turns into poison against itself, in which respect it is infinitely better that God should correct us so as to awaken us, though with never so much severity, than by sparing and prospering us to let us sleep and sin, so that we awake not till it be too late. I now proceed to the second thing I propounded to you, namely, to collect and handle a practical observation from the former parts thus explained, and it shall be this. For a deep sleep, in the spirit of it, to be poured out upon a person or people by God is a very sore judgment. It was this that was the greatest part of Ariel's punishment, the soul of his judgment, not his being under this temporal calamity of a straight siege and captivity, but in being in a deep sleep, when that it came. And it is very observable that this is a judgment that all along in the New Testament is in a manner only taken notice of, it being mentioned, by way of alleging that of Isaiah 6 and 9, by all the four evangelists, as also by Luke in the 28th and Acts and Paul, Romans 11.8. Now, for the prosecution of this observation, I shall show but two things. One, in what it appears that this is such a sore and dismal judgment. Number two, what application to make of it. For the first, I shall show you in what the greatness of the judgment appears in the four parts of the text before explained and that in the text used by the Spirit of God to express the dismalness of this judgment of a deep sleep. The first whereof is a kind of the judgment said to be a deep sleep, which in the very nature of it denotes five things, all which are very penal and dreadful. 1. The first thing that a deep sleep holds forth is liableness and obnoxiousness to judgments, 
unarmedness in the midst of dangers. A man in a deep sleep is in no condition to hinder an invader. He lies naked to the fury of every enemy. He is not in a posture of making any resistance. Like a field without a fence, a city without a watch, like Samson in the midst of the Philistine without his locks. The spiritual sleeper, though judgments approach, approaches not to his tower. He makes not the name of the Lord his refuge. He doesn't close himself up in the wounds of Christ by faith. He labors not by repentance to expel those enemies of his soul, his sins, which will open the door to every judgment, but securely harbors them within. He doesn't labor by prayer to seek help from one that is able to keep him. He doesn't arm himself with preparedness to meet his God. He is ruined without resistance. The fire of vengeance devours him as stubble. He is one fitted for destruction. It is a greater punishment to be without punishments, and yet to lie naked and liable to them, than to be in the midst of them, and yet to be above them. A sleeping sinner spends all his time to fence his estate, his family, his name, his health. But his soul, when death and judgment approaches, lies open and exposed. He takes much care to lock up his rubbish and lumber that are not worth the keeping or taking away, but doesn't preserve his treasure, his jewel, his soul, but throws it among his enemies. The second thing that this judgment of a deep sleep holds forth is self-soothing and flattery, carnal security, self-pleasing. And this is the ground of the former. He is dreaming of a kingdom when Israel's nail is near his temples than a crown. He, as Ariel in the context, fancies himself at a richly furnished table where all manner of delicacies are. But when he awakes, there is a starved, empty stomach. This spiritual sleeper, in the hearing of the words of the curse, blesses himself in his heart and says, I shall have peace. He goes on in sin as if hell were a notion, judgment of God, a fable, and as if the threats of the scripture were but some gainful inventions to uphold the pastor's maintenance. If God give him abundance in this life, he secretly smiles at the severest denunciations and inwardly applauds his own safety and integrity, as Ephraim and Hosea 12.8. Notwithstanding all the prophets could denounce, said, Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. All flattered ones are in danger, but the self-flattered are in the greatest danger, when they shall cry peace and safety, First Thessalonians 5, 3. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them. Peace with oneself accompanied with war against one's God is the worst of wars. Soul soothing is soul slaying. He that would be ever safe must be never secure. Judgments that befall the self-flatterer come not more inevitably than grievously. The same judgment that befalls him with others makes him more miserable than others in regard they expect to be happier. Judgment unthought of is judgment intolerable. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment they go down into the grave. A doleful mirth. Better is that hell that makes way for heaven than that heaven that makes a way for hell. The self-deluder's happiness is a fool's paradise. Never was it known that they were quiet to eternity, that were not disquieted in their sins here. The hell upon earth is to be in the way to hell, and yet to think that the course is steered toward heaven. Number three, this judgment of a deep sleep comprehends a punishment of inactivity, unserviceableness and unprofitableness in the midst of all opportunities and exigencies whatsoever, whether they be the particular exigencies of our own souls or of the Church of Christ. The work is great, but there are no laborers. The spiritual sleep is a summer sluggard, a harvest sleeper. He doesn't stir himself up to lay hold upon God. He doesn't seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness. He doesn't strive to enter in at the straight gate. 
He never offers any violence to the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't work out his salvation. He doesn't wrestle in prayer. He lives as if he had nothing to do in the world. Heaven is not his business. He is, but he lives not, as far from doing any work in the very evening of his life as he was in the dawning of it. He lived like a drone all his days, as if he had been born to look on. Glorious opportunities are before him every Sabbath. Sermon, ordinances, are full of seasons of grace. A rich prize, but he has no heart, no hand. And for the church of Christ be the straits thereof never so great, the work never so abundant, its exigencies never so urgent. This spiritual sleeper takes his rest, but takes no pains. He doesn't help the Lord. May but he be warm in his own feathers. He regards not the dangers of the house. He is a mere mute and cipher, a nullity in the world, a superfluity upon the earth. Jeremiah's rotten girdle, good for nothing, are like the branches of a vine which are but weak and unuseful, good to make no beams or rafters of. He doesn't pray. He doesn't counsel. He doesn't contribute. He is in a deep sleep and has lost his hands. Such a kind of sleep as this to a saint would be the greatest unquietness. Servableness is his heaven. This life would be nothing worth if he might not get Christ and instrumentally give him. Number four. This judgment of a deep sleep comprehends the punishment of unwillingness and loathness to have any disturbance and stirring by any that come to awake. This sluggard is in his warm down, or in his midnight repose, and he doesn't love to be molested. Yet a little more sleep, a little more slumber. This spiritual sleeper doesn't love any that stir him. He accounts them as greatest enemies and tormentors. He that uses means may die, but he that refuses all helps of recovery must die. What will become of those that say to the prophets, Prophesy not! that are mad against the medicine, that cannot endure sound doctrine, that shut their eyes against the sun and stop their ears against the sound of the word. Thus it is with this spiritual sleeper. He is angry with everyone that makes a noise, that will not allow him and his lust to live together in quiet. He that counts a word a burden here shall feel another burden hereafter. Number five. Lastly, this judgment of a deep sleep denotes insensibleness, regardlessness under the threatenings, noise, wounds, and all other administrations used by God to awaken him. Whatever God says or does, the spiritual sleeper doesn't lay it to heart so as to get any good by it. Take it in these five particulars. Number one, he is insensible of danger, like a drunken man that sleeps on the top of a mast, near dangers in regard of execution far from them in regard of apprehension. He puts far from him the evil day. An awakened Christian foresees the danger and provides accordingly. A sleeping sinner fears nothing. Feeling only troubles him, and that too when it is too late. Number two. He is insensible of the loudest noise, severest denunciations. Line may be upon line, precept upon precept pastor after pastor, and all do but fatten his heart and deafen his ears. The most effectual warnings are lifting up the voice like a trumpet. The shrillest denunciations don't work upon him. The lion roars, but he doesn't tremble. Number three, he is insensible of being uncovered and stripped of any comforts and supplies, though God pull off his clothes, take away his friends, his children, estates, and health, his material goods. Though the water pot and a spear be taken from the bolster, he doesn't stir. Like the hen which loses her chickens one by one by the devouring kite, when one or two or three are snatched away, she still continues to pick up what lies before her. Number four. He is insensible of the stirrings and joggings that are given him in his sleep the faithful admonitions of friends, rebuke a scorner, and he hates both rebuke and rebuker. Though often reproved, he stiffens his neck. He and his distemper are so nailed together that reprehensions 
sever them not. Number five, he is insensible of woundings, maimings, the very fetching out of his blood. They regard not the work of the Lord. They refuse to receive correction. When the hand of the Lord is lifted up, they will not see. Gray hairs are here and there upon them, and they know it not. Though smitten, they revolt more and more. Adam's rib was taken out of him, and he didn't feel it. The storms and waves fight against Jonah, and he doesn't observe it. The spiritual sleeper is insensible of judgments in three respects. Number one, he is insensible who wounds. He doesn't think of the hand of God and the miseries that befall him. He only looks at man and doesn't think that it is God who gives him to robbers and spoilers. He doesn't look upward as David when Shimei reviled him. He doesn't see the hand of God when men hurt him, but all his study is how to avenge himself upon or reconcile himself to the instrument, who indeed was used by the hand of providence to do what was done against him. His endeavors in this respect beginning at the wrong end. For God has a negative voice to all the overtures of peace and friendship between man and man. The hand that cuts can only cure. The God that wounds can only heal. Any structure of amity between man and man will soon fall that is not set upon the foundation of a peace with God. Number two, he is insensible why he is wounded, of the deserving cause, sin. As he doesn't look upward, so neither looks he inward. He is not driven by what he feels to observe what he does. No man says what I have done. He searches not his heart to find out the Jonah with in the storm that is arising about him, he traces not the sin, the beast, the print of punishment that it has left upon him, nor labors by the stream to go to the head from whence it issues. Everything shall be blamed sooner than sin, his careless servants, his disobedient child, his cheating chapman, his treacherous commander. But here is not a word of sin all this while. Nay, rather than that shall be blamed, the fault shall be laid upon those that are his greatest friends, and haply most of all desire his good. As it is evident in the dismal example of Saul, who in all his affrightments flew upon innocent David and never looked into himself, nay, rather than sin shall be blamed, cries out upon that which is not, as his hard hap, his fortune, and so on. Number three. He is insensible of the way to cure his wound, and the true way of winding himself out of his miseries. The people, Hosea 7 verse 10, in a time of their calamity and declining, and when their gray hairs were here and there upon them, return not to the Lord their God, nor seek him. For all this, woe unto them, for they have fled from me. They fly to Egypt and Assyria, but they fly from God, who only can help. In verse 16, they return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow, and a like complaint is that of Isaiah, that the people are like a wild bull in a net, that can hamper and entangle itself more and more, but takes no course to wind itself out. Very elegant also is that comparison of Hosea in chapter 13, where it is said that Ephraim is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. The scope is this. The prophet compares the kingdom of Israel to a woman in travail, in regard of its pains and distresses, and the inhabitants to the child in the womb of the mother, and to such a foolish child, which though the mother be in ever such torture, by reason of its continuance in the womb, yet the child takes no care to get forth, but remains there still, though to the killing of mother in itself, though the Israelites had rather stifle themselves in the womb of sin and punishment than leave their sin and save themselves in the kingdom, their mother. In the fifth chapter, he compares them to a sick, wounded person that goes to a wrong medicine for healing, where he says that when Judah saw his sickness and Ephraim his wound, they went to the Assyrian and sent to Jerob, Yet could he not cure them, and so to a silly dove without heart that flies to Egypt and Assyria for help. And yet, verse 13, they fly from God, though indeed there be no way to fly from God, 
but by flying to him. They sent to Jerob, but not to God, and they opened their mouths to be filled with the wind, but stopped them when God offers that which would satisfy them. A spiritual sleeper uses every way but the right way. If there be a wrong, he will be sure to take it. He is sooner ready to destroy himself than his sin, and more inclined with an obstinate heart to go on to ruin than by reviewing the greatness of his provocations and the goodness of him that is provoked, to melt into tears, to ask pardon, to loathe himself and his lusts, and to turn heartily to the Most High. This is the complaint of Isaiah, that the people will return not to him that smites them. Dismal is that denunciation of God, that after all their famine and wars and losses and captivities, they should notwithstanding all these wounds, they that are left, pine away in their iniquity. Notwithstanding the deaths of thousands before their eyes, their abode in their enemy's land, the visible tokens of the displeasure of an angry God, yet to pine away and swelter in sin as if nothing could awaken them. How dreadful is this! There is the first thing in the text in which a spiritual deep sleep appears to be so dreadful a judgment. In respect of the nature and kind of it, open in five particulars. The second particular in the text, in which the greatness of this judgment is set forth, is a measure of it, held out in a double expression, of the pouring out of it, of the pouring the spirit of it, of pouring it. And this notes that when this deep sleep ceases upon people, as it did upon these in the text, that it overwhelms them, it runs all over them, it is such a dead palsy as stupefies the whole body that leaves no part of it free, like a city that is so begirt with an enemy, and about which is there so straight a siege that there is no going either in or out. So here the pastors of the gospel don't know where to set upon, or how to endeavor entrance into these spiritually sleeping sinners. How difficult a thing is it to cure that patient, who in every part of his body, outward and inward, is distempered, when the whole body is all over one wound, and malady, as it were. Number two. The second expression that sets out the measure of this deep sleep is the spirit of it, word that properly notes the power and the vehemency of this distemper. As the spirit of a thing is the force and vigor and strength of it, so here is denoted the efficacy and powerfulness of this deep sleep in these people. And over them now, what a judgment is it for a man to be under the power of sin, to be a prisoner to the soul's greatest enemy, to be in the bond of iniquity, to be held in the cords of his sin, to have the soul garrisoned with a thousand of such strong men armed as the weakest of them is stronger than an army of men, surely to be under the power of the greatest tyrant's breathing. There is not a punishment comparable to this, it is a power that none in the world can match, but only the power of him that is also an enemy to him that is a spiritual sleeper. If it be the power of God that keeps to salvation, the power of sin and Satan, if not overpowered, must needs keep it to damnation. It is such a power as resists all the means that come to rescue the soul from it, and that so deeply seizes upon the sinner that it makes him purely subdued, bow down under it, and yet, which is worst of all, the nature of this power stands in making a man unwilling as well as unable to get from under it, he being a very slave in everything but only in that which is common to all others that are in bondage, namely to sigh and groan under it. Number three. The third particular in the text in which the dismalness of this judgment of a deep sleep is set out in the object, the persons upon whom it is powered, you, where we may take notice of two things, one, the parties of it. Number two, the part of these parties that the prophet here intends to be under a deep sleep. The parties, you. You, a people that are under all my awakening administrations of words and threatenings, of judgments and examples, you have I known of all the nations of the earth. With you have I taken pains more with all the people in the world beside. And for you to be in a deep sleep is a greater both sin and shame and punishment than for others. 
None are such approved tried friends to lust as they that continue in it under the means of recovery. None so inexcusable for continuing in their spiritual slumber as they that have had helps to awaken them. It is a shame for any to be in a sleep, but more for them that are in the light, the sun, the sound of the word. It is not so great a marvel for others to be asleep, whom God never brought under those helps that might stir them up. But for those that live in the daytime of the gospel, and are under all the stirring of a ministry of the prophets to continue slumbering in sin, there can be no apology. The apostle makes this an argument that Christians should beware of this distemper of spiritual sloth. Let us not sleep as do others. It is enough for those that are in the night of sin and nature to sleep. We should not. It was the argument that the angel used to Jacob, let me go for the day breaks. Whosoever is not awakened by the light of the day, the gospel, shall be awakened by the heat of eternal flames. Number two. The second thing is the part of these parties upon which the spiritual sleep ceases, and that is intended by the prophet to be the soul. The soul of a judgment is its season upon the soul. Spiritual blessings are the greatest, and spiritual judgments the dismalest. There are three things in which it appears that the judgment of a deep sleep is greatened by befalling the soul first. The soul is the excellency of man, the worthiest part. The body is the body of vileness. The soul, a precious soul, excellent every way, but as it is depraved with sin. It is the noblest part of man, noble and in respect of its original. It is heaven-born, in respect of its functions, its endowments. If all be well with the soul, a man is happy, though the body be never so miserable. If it go ill with the soul, that man is wretched. Let the body abound never so much with outward blessings. When a mean contemptible man, and one of no account, dies, it is never spoken of. But when a prince or some great man dies, all lay it to heart. The soul is the prince, the body is but the page, and therefore the body is not to be lamented, from which only the soul departs, but the soul from which God himself departs. The distempers that befall the soul are hardest to remove. There is no herb in the garden, no receipt from the physician, no medicine in the shop that can cure the soul. Men are only parents of the body, and only physicians of the body. He that made the soul can only mend it. The father of spirits is the only physician of spirits. It is omnipotent strength that recovers sin sick souls. Man can make them worse, but it is only God that can make them better. Outward helps cannot cure the inward man. The God of the heart can only restore the hidden man of the heart. He that sits in heaven must touch and teach the heart, otherwise it can never be reached or taught. The distempers that befall the soul are most deadly, if they are not remedied. A scratch on the finger is a slight wound. But a wound that reaches to the heart is always dangerous, if not deadly. Whatsoever befalls the body is but slight, and to be slighted in comparison of what annoys the soul. Soul curses are the only dreadful ones. All calamities may be in mercy that befall the body, for they only part between us, health, wealth, and friends, and so on. But they which befall the soul... Part us in some measure from him in whom all blessedness and true happiness is laid up. If the soul lives, the man doesn't die. If the soul be dead in sin, the man is dead in sin. The life of our lives is a health of the soul. The death in death is a miscarriage of the soul. If a man be not heartsick, though otherwise much distempered, tis not looked upon as dangerous. He that is not spiritually and soul, and sin-sick, is not sick unto death. The sicknesses and distempers of the body are but only such an appearance. The fourth thing in the text that makes the spirit of a deep sleep so dreadful a calamity is he who inflicts it, he who punishes with it, and that is the Lord Jehovah, the Lord whose punishments are always either the sorest or the sweetest. If they better not those whom they befall, they ever hurt them. Now this is a punishment ever of hurt and destruction. 
not the cutting of a surgeon or a friend, but of an enemy and a destroyer. It is a blessing of God to correct and love us, a great curse for God to punish and leave us. Nay, so to punish is a very punishment is the leaving of us. The happiness of correction stands in teaching us, but this punishment of a deep sleep is a giving us up to unteachableness. There are three things in which it appears that it is a great addition to this judgment for God to inflict it. In regard, it is that God, who is the God of all mercy, and the Father of all consolation, the God that is the giver of every good and perfect gift, for him to punish is very dismal. Who shall pity if he punishes? If others punish and God pity, there is comfort yet and hope. But who shall be our friend when the Lord will frown? If mercy be our enemy, who or what shall be our friend? The Lord that opens the ears and the eyes of his people, that teaches them in his ways, that makes them the prophet, that lightens their eyes lest they sleep the sleep of death. It is this God that punishes the obstinate sinner with this judgment. It was a great aggravation of Esau's punishment to misuse the blessing because his father had blessed his brother immediately before. Bless me, even me also my father, he says. For the same breath that blesses a saint to blast you. For the same servant that melts a humble soul into tears. For sin to stupefy you in sin. For the same son that dissolves another hardens you. For the same gale that blows on heavenward, to drive you occasionally hellward, here's a judgment indeed. If a man sin against God, who shall entreat for him? If God set himself against a man, who shall recover him? Number two. A deep sleep in respect of the inflictor is a great punishment, because inflicted by God in the deepest of his displeasure, as the last and the source of his judgments in this life. He never does it but when he is provoked to the purpose. He inflicts it as a reckoning for all other faults that went before, when all means and helps of recovery are despised. When God is showing mercy, the last mercies are the best, and the further he goes in mercy, the sweeter he is. And so when he is in punishing, the last punishments are the sorest, and the further he goes, the bitterer he is. He both loves and leaves gradually. This judgment of pining away in iniquity is the last that God mentions after all those dismal ones they are spoken of to befall the people, Leviticus 26, 39. It is the last judgment, the lowest stayer of hell upon earth. It is even contiguous to, as I may say, and bordering up on hell itself. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still, is the last judgment we read of be falling in this life, in all the New Testament, a judgment inflicted upon those that despise the offers of Christ and grace. So he gave them up. So, how, and when? My people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts. When God is punishing with this judgment, he says, as Abisha, when he offers to smite Saul, said, I will smite him to the earth at once and I will not smite him the second time. Application If a deep sleep be so great a judgment, and the greatness of it stands in the forementioned particulars, there is in a heavy judgment either fallen or falling upon us in England, upon you, my lords of the Parliament, from falling into it to the utmost, the lowest degree. The Lord preserve us, but what we are fallen into it to a very dismal degree, I am confident may be too clearly evidenced. The particulars mentioned, comprehended in the very kind or sort of the judgment of a deep sleep, will be found in a deep measure to agree with what is becoming us.